Scott, you got to stay though. Sorry. <laughs> yep, I thought sixth grade Jethro Bodine is going down. <laughs> He's the only living one left. The Billy Beverly Hillbillies main cast. I want to encourage you again, as many did earlier, plan to be here Saturday night. Randy Stonehill will be here in concert. If you don't usually get out on Saturday nights, get out on this one. I think you'll be blessed. He'll also be with us in service next Sunday. Um, but plan to be a part of that service. Randy Stonehill is a fellow that um, go back to the 70s, 80s. You can find him on YouTube, and you'll find that if you remember the Larry Norman, Randy Stonehill, second chapter of Acts with Matthew Ward. Uh, you got to be old to remember all these people. Um, <laughs> But I remember, I got excited when I was talking to he and his wife, and I told him, I said, you know, because he was young, and he's only 60, I think two years old, so he's not much older than me, but at the same time, he was young, making his way through Christian music, and um, so at the time, when we were just learning of Christian contemporary music, and he always had some interesting songs, and he's just got a good heart, so plan to be here and be a part of what the Lord's doing this coming Saturday night, 7 o'clock. We'll have folks in the community. There are some brochures, I think, still out here on the library table out here in the foyer, and uh, you can pick up some of those and pass it out to other people and invite them to come. I think it's going to be a great time. Um, we are blessed if you get an opportunity also, and just uh, as you walk around out there, we're getting close to the end of the, the finishing out the pavilion. Um, it's getting close. Uh, we got to get the basketball goal up and a few other things done uh, before we can truly release everything. Um, and so we are blessed. The door. Yeah, the door cut through that too. Um, we're blessed and it's getting closer, um, but it is it's got a few more odds and ends that we got to do, but it is getting closer, so we are blessed with that and it'll be fully functional here in the next uh, month or so, and no later than that probably. Our lives are full. If you haven't noticed, your life is full. Everybody here, you probably have something to do this afternoon. I know the session does. We got session meeting. Those that just newly ordained and reinstalled. Um, we got session this afternoon. We got things going on tonight. You got things happening tomorrow. There's usually something going on. Your life is really full of activities. Everything is going on in your life. We went to a retirement dinner last night for Sheriff Curry, uh, his uh, farewell tour of this week, and, and he'll officially not be sheriff at midnight on the 20th, going to 19th to the 20th. Uh, the new sheriff will take over on the 20th. Um, so just a lot of things that go on, a lot of things that happen in your life. And so most of our lives are full in activities. They're full of things that are going on. But, but think about it not just in activity-wise. Your life is full of what you choose to do or what you choose not to do. How many things this past week did you choose not to do? I mean, you had the opportunity to do this, you had the opportunity to do that, there's this going on, that going on, and you chose not to do it or you chose to do it because I said, just, just too many things going on. I know when my boys and they were into sports, everything in the world, we had, we went from soccer to basketball to baseball to soccer, and I was like, all right, we got to choose something here. This is just way too much and way too many things going on. So let's find something and be good. And they've chosen soccer. We've stuck with that. And they're good at it. And I appreciate them being good at it. But I said, we gotta, Daddy's got to have a rest every once in a while. Because this is just everything. And we're just kind of going from place to place, thing to thing, doing this, doing that. That's defining all of our lives, mostly. Here's the thing I want to share with you today. This is when you're looking in the Scripture. And, and Ephesians is one of my favorite books you'll find in the Bible. One of my favorite letters that Paul wrote. Because there's so much compacted within this. But he starts telling us in this part right here, and as we read there, it says, Be careful on how you live. Do not be unwise in this day and time. The days are evil. Now, if you watch the news at all, you understand that statement right there is to be so true. The days are evil. There are things that go on to every one of us. We kind of shake our head and go on, how in the world? Well, I want to tell you something. If you don't believe there's demonic forces out there, just watch the news. There are demonic forces out there that are working, orchestrating to make these days even more evil than they are. And the only counter that we have for that is for a group of people that believe in Jesus Christ to make a difference in this world. That's what God's calling us to do. The only reason we are left here after you get your born again experience, the only reason you're left here is to prove the victory of Jesus Christ over evil. To prove that victory. 
And that's what God's called us to do in our lives, the way we live our lives. You've got to back up a little bit beyond this Ephesians, the fifth chapter. If you still have your Bible open, you can back up there and look in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And he starts a little part of this, and he's, in, in my Bible it has, in this section, living as children of light. He gives you some understanding here of how you get there of being what I call the fullness of God, being full of God. Because every one of us are full of something that's going on about your life. There's activities. You're, you're, there are people that are full of themselves. Everything is about them. Now, nobody in here, so don't look around. But you'll find that you get around people and everything is about them, about their life, what's going on. God's calling us to live as a children of light, it says here in Ephesians 4, chapter. So if you look there in verse 14, he says, So I tell you this and insist on it. In the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened and their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all, in, all sensitivity and given themselves over to sensuality and to indulge in every kind of impurity with continual lust for more. Sin always begets more sin. Here's the thing that I would say we've got to do. In order to be full of God, the first place you've got to go is you've got to start change in the thinking aspect. And in your thinking apparatus, which is that thing that sits on top of your head, on top of your shoulders, and somewhere in your skull there's a thinking apparatus that God uses. And also that the enemy tempts you to use towards the world. That's why Paul's looking at him and says, you've got to change from the way you used to think, the way you did when you were a Gentile, when you're out there in all sensuality, because if you do not, you will not live as a children of light. So the first step, if you want to live full of God in this year, if you want to find that fullness of God and that life that is life-giving, the first place you got to start is in that get rid of that futility of thinking is what he says. Get rid of that darkened understanding of this world. Now, folks, a few places you got to go is how you entertain yourself. Be careful. There are things, young people, some of those games that are out there just because you can play them don't mean you should play them. Hmm. There's some things out there that's offering you and gets you into a realm of just murder and all kind of stuff and you're kind of going no you really don't need to be there you don't need to go in that area and you say well it doesn't harm me does it help you draw you close to God you know those are the questions that not only I ask you as young people as we as older ones how do you entertain yourself you think well I do it like I got my favorite shows and stuff think about your favorite shows how many of them have interjected an alternate lifestyle into every one of your favorite shows as the norm? As the norm. This is normal. I mean, I look at some of the commercials for some of the shows that are out now that you've got uh, man and man, right? I mean, God never intended for these things. But we entertain ourselves with this and say, well, it doesn't affect me because I'm bigger than this. Folks, I'm going to tell you, it's not about whether it affects you in every aspect of your life. But Paul is insisting on this. He says, leave the way the Gentiles do it. Leave the way the world does it. You need to be in this world, but not of this world. There's a big difference right there when you start looking at the way we think about things. And I know me even saying this today, saying, well, you ain't taking my show away from me, preacher. I'm not going to. If God can't, there's no way I can. I can tell you that it's not good for you. I can tell you that me eating 15 Little Debbies before I go to work is not good for me. But it's still my choice. And I can do whatever I want to. And God can go, Donnie, that's not really good for you. I didn't design your body that way. You know what? You'll get diabetes. Well, God, I like it. And this is what I want. So I'll take my insulin shot, whatever i got to take in order to have my Little Debbies because it doesn't affect me. It doesn't bother me. How many times do we argue with God? Uh, God, that's, that's not it. When somebody, you'll hear somebody start preaching and your parents start preaching to you as young people. You say, Mom, Dad, leave me alone. Nah, it doesn't bother me. Well, so far I've seen it bother your attitude. I've seen it bother your actions. I've seen it how it affects you. Yes, it bothers you. And if it bothers you, it bothers me as a parent. The great thing is, not only does God take care of us and He starts looking at us, and this is why the Paul said, if you want to live as children of light, if you want to live a life that's full of God, you got to start in that first place of thinking. That's that place where all the signals start firing. When your thought processes are off, then guess what? Your whole life can be steered in the wrong direction. You'll find that in every one of our actions that we have in your life, you think back on the last time. Now, I know some of you are going to have a hard time recalling this, but the last time you sinned. 
Some of you can't even remember the last time you sinned. I know, I know. That's why you're the ones here in church. We're all righteous. We don't need a hospital. But the last time you sinned, where did it start? It started with a thought. It started with a picture in your mind. It started somewhere in, this, in between the cavities of your ears. And you started thinking, I really don't like that person. In fact, I hate them. They did me wrong. Brr. You get to dwell on it. You get to go. That's why Paul, when he's telling me, he said, you've got to leave this futility of thinking. You've got to leave the way the Gentiles are doing. In 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, it talks about bringing down those strongholds. And when you start seeing when the apostle Paul is telling the church in Corinth, he's telling them, he says, we're waging war in this thing. He says, we're not waging according to the way the world does. Though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, demolish arguments, and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought that make it obedient to Christ. And we'll be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Now folks, I want to tell you something. You cannot win the battle of your mind if you're sending out invitations to the enemy. He said, I would never do that. Yes, we do. We send out invitations when the Bible says we don't take hold captive those thoughts. We don't demolish the pretense against God. And here's the pretense comes in. And here's where we start getting those things. It's saying, well, it doesn't affect me. I was going to tell you something. We wouldn't be having some of the arguments we have right now in the public arena if we haven't let it affect us so much. We have kowtowed to the political correctness. We've cowed down to the things that go on in this world. And we say, well, it's just... You can live your life however you want to. It won't affect me. As long as you're not in my peripheral of vision or in my sphere of influence, it won't if you can do what you... Hollywood can do whatever they want. But when we lay down the 8 to 10, 12 bucks to go see what Hollywood produces, it affects us. You think, well, that's kind of Puritan in thought. No, it's not. It's just at that point where we each one have to start looking and really evaluating, does this, is this something that really will please God in my life? It actually brings thoughts in our minds that we really can't control. So what happens is when we do not demolish the strongholds, it goes on to the next step, and you'll find here in Ephesians the fourth chapter, it says, You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of Him and were taught in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God and true righteousness and holiness so to change our thinking starts changing our choices what was the last time that you started thinking boy you know they're they're having a funeral today for um lady that that really was uh, that she didn't she did great things in my life and one bad thing she did she fostered a banana pudding addiction i have about every week I love Jean, and she was, uh, she was awesome, and she tried to teach Mindy how to make that, but I'm like, take a handful of this, and take a handful of that, and take a little, and her hands were this big, and Mindy's like, what, what is that, Jean? But she can make a banana pudding, but she was one that I would actually have to make a choice every week to go over to their house and eat it, because somebody had to eat it. <laughs> you get into my thinking process, and they say, preacher, we got banana pudding in the stove and I said man I am there she heated it up for me and got a big old glass of milk that was awesome so I always made a choice but here's where our thought process starts and then if we do not filter that thought process and get rid of that thought process of the old way of thinking what happens in our life is then our choices are affected how many times have we made a choice and we're going why in the world did I make that choice well, it wasn't something that came to you yesterday. Some of us that have walked off into sin and been there for a while and been held captive by sin, if you'll take a few steps back and you think about how you got there, you got there with a thought. You got there with a thought that turned into a choice. You ask anybody that's addicted to drugs, how did they get there? You got there because somebody offered a thought to you. You know, if you've ever known somebody that's a drug dealer, what do they do? They tried to entice you with the freebie. Here, this won't cost you anything. Take this hit. This won't cost you a thing at all. What they're doing is they're entrepreneurs and they're trying to build up their business, which is exactly what Satan does. He is an entrepreneur trying to build up his business. He'll say, here, try this. This is not a big deal. 
It's a little bit of hatred, but it won't taste, it tastes bad right now, this hatred. But it won't taste bad in the long run. Just go ahead and hate this person. It won't hurt you. Drug dealer standing on the street corner. Here, take this hit. It's not a big deal. And in your mind, you're going, I know I'm not supposed to do that because I've been told all my life that that would be wrong to do that. You take any sin and plug it in right there. We've been told that's not it. Young people, when you go off to college, you've been told by your parents right and wrong. You've been told by what is good, what is bad. It's going to be your choice. Right now in high school, you're faced with a lot of choices. You're going to have to find that in your life, you're going to have to make that decision, not just because mom and dad said this is wrong, but you've got to make that decision by going, no, this I can see. Look at your friends who made the choice. I used to look at my friends who would say, okay, one beer wouldn't bother them. But then when they're picking their head up out of their own throw up, thinking they can handle this, and I'm going, so that one turned into 24, and now you're laying in the parking lot, and I'll tell you something, this is not good. You'll find that every choice that we make starts with that thought, but that's why Paul says you've got to leave that futility of darkness of choice, of thoughts, and then you've got to come to this place where you start making those decisions. He says you are taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. There's your choice. You got to say, no, that's a part of the past. I can't be a part of that because to be a part of that means I'm going to be filling my life with something that's contrary to Scripture. And to fill your life with something that's contrary to Scripture sometimes makes some tough decisions. You got to make some tough decisions not to fill your life with contrary things to Scripture. There are times that your friends will say, you know, and it goes all your life, not just when you're young people, but you have friends say, come on, this is not a big deal. And you're going, no, no, I don't really need to do that. you, you got to go with that gut feeling at times. You'll say, I, I know there's something wrong with this, but I really can't put my finger on what is wrong with this. But there's something amiss here. So you find yourself, you start thinking those things, and you got to choose Christ each day of your life. And so when you look through that passage there, and you see not only is it thought process, it brings us to choices, but then choices bring us to that place of action. You can say, well, it doesn't affect me because I can choose to think this way or do this way. Folks, I'll tell you something. If you choose to think a certain way that is contrary to Scripture, it will produce actions. It always does. Whatever you think about and whatever you choose to do, you can say, well, I've never really acted on this. We've got friends of ours that have gone and have struggled with the homosexuality issue. They said, well, they've never really acted on it. We've got one that has started. He said, well, he's just gone full bore to it. Because his thoughts were always, that's, he always flirted with the idea. He's gone full bore. I mean, it's just off the deep end with it. And I'm sitting there going, because he fought it for so long, now it's not even fighting it. It's just like, okay, just welcome it on in. And I'm sitting there thinking, what is it going to take? But it's not just him, it's us. We look at what the Apostle Paul is writing here, and he's telling us, if you want to live as children of light, then your life has got to be full of God. To be full of God, it comes through that thought process. It comes through that choices, and they show up in your actions. If you wonder how your thought process is, just back it up a step or two and start looking at your actions. What has this week been like for you? What are your actions this week? How did it look? Did you fuss people out? I didn't say cuss. I said fuss. You say, well, I didn't cuss anybody out. Well, fuss people out is just about as bad. How many people are standing around watching you and your Christian witness as you're just jumping off? I didn't cuss them. It doesn't matter. Is that the witness you want? Is that what God is calling for in your life? And here's the choice that we make in our lives is that my actions have to prove something. Your actions are proving something. Every one of us, our actions are proving whether we're following Jesus or whether we're going with the futility of mind of what we used to be. That's why Paul says, leave what you used to be, start thinking of life difference, bring down those strongholds that produce the actions that you used to have. You'll find there in 28 through 32, as he continues on, 29 through 32, he says, do not let any unwholesome talk. Here are the actions. Come out of your mouth. But only what is helpful for building up of others according to their needs. That it may benefit those who listen. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed with the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind, compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. Look at all those actions in there. I'll tell you something. You cannot harbor in your mind anger, bitterness, and it not produce actions somewhere. You cannot harbor thoughts in your mind thinking, well, it won't affect anybody but me. 
You can't harbor those thoughts in your mind saying, well, I can get away with this because nobody knows. It's just in the recesses of my mind. Well, folks, I'll tell you something. Eventually, that thinking changes and it turns things around. I was grieved by, in my heart yesterday. I found out a friend of mine that, that um, I'd always looked at and it was just totally upstanding. I uh, left his family. I don't know what happened. But more he went off the reservation. And it's grieved my heart. You know, I'm sitting there going, well, it started somewhere in the thoughts. Not satisfied here, so we look here. Those thoughts entertain, in those thoughts, they will entertain some choices. And so what the choices is, and men, you know, I know something, it starts in a thought. Affairs start with a thought. It doesn't start with, okay, I think I'll just go out and have an affair today. I think I'll just go out and just leave my family and have an affair. It starts with a thought right there. And then that thought, blossoms into some choices. And what are those choices? You linger a little bit longer around the water cooler and you think that's no big deal. You just kind of hang out there. Or you find that appreciation and you kind of hang out there. Or women. It's as bad as women now. There's some women that you just kind of go like what Lucy Ricardo was in those days of I Love Lucy, the Wicked City Woman. They want to vamp you, Wicked City Woman. If you've never seen that one, young people, you need to go back and watch Lucy. It's Tennessee Ernie Ford. Going to vamp you. Oh, she's going to rub his head. He's like, vamp me some more, little kiss. You see? <laughs> anyway, I got sidetracked. How many times do we know that it all starts somewhere and then it looks, and then finally, when the actions are produced, you can back it up, maybe years. And you go, okay, this is where we went off the rails. We stopped reflecting Christ in our thoughts. We stopped bringing down the strongholds. We started entertaining those strongholds. And we started making a place for them in our lives. And then we started making choices that would accommodate those strongholds. And when the choices are made, then we've got to act it out. Because Satan will always give us a stage to act it out on. Always. Always, always. I've seen it in all of our lives. I've seen it in my life. I've seen it that we are defined and remembered by our actions. How many times has someone want to bring your past back up? Not the good things, but the one time that you really had a bad attitude and you blew it. They always want to go, okay, I thought you were a Christian. I mean, you lived 90, 90 years out with Jesus and you had one day that you kind of just fussed out somebody. I ain't going to believe you anymore. And you, those actions are what defines you in that relationship. Well, folks, I want to tell you something. Yeah, sometimes the enemy gets the best of us in a day. It doesn't define who we are. But I'll tell you what, actions that are repetitive define who we are. How do we define addicts? We define addicts not just through their actions, but through their attitudes, through their thinking process. They live their life for their next fix. Their next little Debbie, they got to have that. And everything revolves around that. They've got to have that little Debbie. Whatever it is, they've got to have that. And so all their actions correlate with, I've got to get to that. Most of us, as we start looking and we look at the actions of our life, we're remembered by that. That's why Paul says this. He tells us through the Scriptures, he says, get rid of all these things. He said, do what the, speak those things out of your mouth that builds others up. According to need, benefit those who listen. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How do we grieve the Holy Spirit of God? is that we say, oh, I love you, Jesus, and in the same way, we let at the pure, pureness of that be corrupted by the bitterness of our own heart. And then we go over and say, oh, I love Jesus, but I cannot stand that person. And everybody looking at you is going, well, what was that? Ain't no one want to drink out of that. That wasn't pure waters of the Holy Spirit flowing out. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. The last thing, and this is one of the things I want you to know this. Not only do we get in this place, and Paul's writing through this, and, and, and the reason I took the end part of Ephesians, the fifth chapter, because I want you to read through all of that. Because the fifth part, when you start at the beginning of this, he tells us this. He says, be imitators of God. Therefore, dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering, a sacrifice of God. So he goes through those things, and this is just Donnie's version of this and the preaching of the aspect of this. He goes, he said, I want you to change your thinking. I want you to challenge, challenge your choices, and I want these actions to reflect Christ. Why is that important? Because the way we walk this thing out is if we're going to imitate God. Amen. Imitation is a serious form of flattery. And so we look at this and say, well, the results that you walk in are all those things combined. And if you're going to walk in these aspects, and what happens is you are going to imitate God. 
People are going to look at your life and they're going to say, hey, there's something to you. He goes on here in verse 8, it says, For once you walked in darkness, now you are light of the, you are in the light of the Lord. Live as children of light. The fruit of light consists of all goodness, righteousness, truth, and find out what pleases God. Have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness. Rather expose them, for it is shameful to mention what the disobedient do even in secret. We watch it on TV. But what everything is exposed by light becomes visible, for it is light that makes everything visible. That's why it is said, Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead. Christ will shine on you. Be careful then how you live, how you think, your choices you make, the actions you have. That's the result of your life, whether you're imitating God, whether your life's full of God or not. When you get down to this last part, it tells us this. It says, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, leads to all kind of stuff. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Well, folks, I'll tell you this. To be filled with the Spirit, you've got to realize there's an emptiness. To have that emptiness, you've got to get rid of some of the stuff in your life. You won't want God. You won't want to be full of God if your life is full of everything in this world. You won't want it. And when the preacher starts talking and saying, you can have more of God, you're going, I'm satisfied with what I got. Folks, if that is your answer, if you're satisfied with what you got, there's more of God that you've even taken. You realize He's an infinite God and we want a finite pool of God? And He's saying, I've got more here if you want more, but it's going to take you emptying something out of your life so that you can experience the fullness of God. Starts with the thinking, then the choices. Then the actions. To imitate God, we've got to walk in the fullness of God. All right, here's how we'll close this. A band, if y'all come on, we're going to sing the song in closing. Here's how we'll close this out. If anyone here, you sit there going, man, I, I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm captive in some thoughts. I want you to come for prayer today. I've got these thoughts. Some of them's good, some of them's bad. But I want you to come for prayer because I believe that God in agreement with the Word of God and people praying for you, that you can get free of some of those things. All of them if we choose to. Demolish the strongholds. Some of you, it may be in the choices that you made. Got to get free of the choices. Some of those choices you made is because of the thoughts. But you start looking and it's like, look, I want a fresh start. Then the third thing would be that of how your actions are. Only you can look at it and say, okay, not too good right now. If somebody were to look at your life, would they say, boy, that is the best imitation of God I've ever seen? Or would they look at you and they would be totally shocked if you told them you were a Christian? They would look at you and go, really? If that is their response, you better back it up because you're full of yourself and not of God. Here's my challenge. Do you need prayer in those areas today? You want to be full of the Holy Spirit? He says, ask for it. He says, He'll give you more. And you say, well, didn't I get all the Holy Spirit when I got saved? Yes, you did. He didn't get all of you. He's still been working on us. It's a daily sacrifice. There's still some crevices of all of our hearts that the Holy Spirit probably could feel. I invite you to come this morning. Let's stand as we sing. What can... Blood of Jesus, yeah. Nothing but the blood. If you have prayer need, I'll invite you to come quickly. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Come on, as we sing this song. If you got prayers, come on. <clears throat> Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus for my pardon this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For my <coughs> sin this I plead Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious
Today, as we close out the service, it is awesome. I don't talk a lot about church membership here, but to be a member of this church, it is you need to come either on profession of faith or you can come transfer of letter, either one. The importance of church membership, and, and for those who've been members of churches, the importance of that, and there's many reasons for it, is to identify with the body, and that is for accountability. It's also saying, okay, I'm willing to serve in this church. And I want to identify and serve in this church. And so we got a couple of folks that want to join here today. Dave, come on up. And Joe, they're going to come today on either transfer or profession. So.